Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to look into your word. We ask that you will speak to our hearts and minds as we continue to learn your way in this sanctuary. Bless every listener that's, that will, that's listening now, that will listen in the future to this broadcast, and that uh, you will bless them in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're continuing to look at types and shadows, a biblical look at the sanctuary message. And just to let you know, when we're done with this sanctuary series, we will transition into Daniel and Revelation in our studies. So I just want to let you know that uh, because in order to understand Daniel Revelation, you have to have a foundation understanding the biblical sanctuary message. So we'll do that very soon in the near future. So types and shadows, a biblical look at the sanctuary message. And we've been looking at this, uh, this, illustrated classroom we looked at the gate the gate of this fine twine linen fence uh, we've looked at that uh, we see that the gate points to Jesus Christ there's only one way to justification uh, and that is through Jesus there is only one way to enter into the experience of righteousness by faith and that is through Christ so in order for us to have this experience, we must first come to Christ, come to the door, the gate. Jesus says, I am the door in John chapter 10. Then we go to the altar. At the altar, the altar not only points to Christ's death for us, but it also points to us surrendering our lives to him, consecrating our times, our, our means, our talents, our treasures to him. And so we lay all on the altar, just like Jesus laid it all on the altar for us, died on that cross for us, and we're going to give our lives for him. So after we pass that altar, we go to the labor. Just like L Jesus was buried and rose again, even so we are to be baptized and rise up to walk in the newness of life, according to Romans chapter 6. And so after this experience of justification, we move forward into the tabernacle itself, and notice there's a door here. And it's a door of fine twine linen with blue, purple, and scarlet, just like the gate for the outer court. And it shows us that it's not just like the outer court is a door to justification. There's only one way to sanctification for this tabernacle. And so as we go through the tabernacle, we also looked at the various layers of that. I'm not going to uh, review. You can go back and listen to that video, and that'll also be on YouTube very soon. But... When we go through the tabernacle, inside the tabernacle, we enter into an experience of sanctification. So it just doesn't end at justification. No, we got to go from justification to sanctification, which ultimately will prepare us for glorification. So when you enter into the experience of sanctification, meaning living in a life, living a life of obedience, you are covered. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all, not some, all, not just nine, all, all, ten of his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon thee, shall come on thee, and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then he says in verse 15, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So if we're living a life of obedience, maintaining this sanctification experience by faith, if we live a life of obedience, we can experience blessings. If we live a life of disobedience, we can experience curses. This is what the Bible is teaching us right here. So when you're living in obedience, you are covered. Great Controversy 530, paragraph 1. Satan is well aware that the weaker soul who abides in Christ is more than a match for the host of darkness. And that should he reveal himself openly he would be met and resisted. Therefore, he seeks to draw away the soldiers of the cross from, the strong, from their strong fortification. While he lies in ambush 
with his forces, ready to destroy all who venture upon his ground. So you venture upon his ground, you're not covered. When you stay in Christ, when you allow Christ to, uh, while, while you're abiding in Christ and allow Christ to live in you, you are covered. Living an obedient life, you're covered. But when you step out of Christ and start venturing on Satan's territory, on his ground, by dabbling in sin, you're not covered. It says, only in humble reliance upon God and obedience to all his commandments can we be secure. Great Controversy 530, paragraph 1. So today's, the, to, this evening's topic is, are you hungry? Give us this day our daily bread. So we're going inside of the tabernacle. So when you enter into the tabernacle, the first article of furniture you would see to your right is the table of showbread. As you can see right here in this picture, you see the table of showbread to your right, the seven branch candlestick to your left, and straight ahead is the altar, the golden altar of incense. We're gonna look at all these things. And then of course you have the veil separating the holy from the most holy place. Where right now, when you first enter into the tabernacle, you enter into the holy place. After the holy place, you enter into the most holy place where you have the Ark of the Testament or Covenant. This is what the Bible says about the table of showbread. Exodus 26, verse 35. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on what side? On the north side. So that, again, that, that, that table is to your right on the north side. Now, what was the size and material for the table of showbread? Exodus 25, looking at verse 23 to 25, the Bible says, Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereunto, make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of an hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. We're going to break all this down just now. So we've been through this measurement of a cubit before. One cubit equals 1.5 feet, one and a half feet. And some sources say one foot six inches. But we're going to say one and a half feet right here. So we take two times 1.5. That will give us three feet. So the table of showbread is three feet long. And then we take one cubit times 1.5 that gives us one and a half so it's one and a half feet wide three feet long one and a half feet wide how high is it it's one and a half cubit times 1.5 that gives us two and one fourth so it's two and one fourths high feet high So imagine as the priest gets the bread, he has to kind of bow as he gets the bread or takes the bread. We're going to show what this, this table of showbread represents. Now, what did the gold and the crown and the border on the table symbolize? Now, I'm not saying he was bowing to the table, but in order to get the emblems, of course, he had to kind of bow down because it wasn't a tall structure. He had to kind of bend down. But that, that points to something. Job 22, verse 25. We're going to see what that gold represents. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. That word gold, I mean, that word defense in the original Hebrew, the word defense means gold. So the gold points to divinity. What about the wood? For the table was made of wood and it was overlaid with gold. What does the wood point to? Isaiah 61, looking at verse 3. Isaiah 61, 
verse three. This is what the Bible says. Isaiah 61 verse three to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that they might be that he might be glorified. So the wood points to humanity. I believe we talked about this already before, but this is kind of a review. So the Achaia wood or the Shittim wood came from the Achaia tree. So the wood points to humanity. We see gold and wood. Gold pointing to divinity, wood pointing to divinity. All right, we're going to point to what this point, who this represents. Who does this point to? Go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John 1, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Bible is letting us know that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Some translations, like the Jehovah's Witness translation, says the word was a God. That is incorrect. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say that Jesus, because this is who this re represents, Jesus is not fully God. But the scripture lets us know in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought and not robbery, to be equal with God. To be equal means you're on the same level. But some will have you believe that he's not on the same level. But that's not scriptural. The Bible lets us know in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You see the father and the son, they were together. The son was there with the father as one brought up with him. And the Bible says all things were made by him. By who? The word. And without him was not anything made that was made. He played a very important role in creation. And then verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Who's the only begotten of the father? That's Jesus. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this pointing to Jesus. No, he wasn't begotten in distant eternity. No, he came, he, he was fully God, equal to the father, existed with him throughout all eternity. The plan of salvation was laid. Jesus at the appointed time said, prepare me a body. He took upon himself our sinful nature, humanity. He always was divine. He still is divine, but he took upon himself divinity. So he's divinity and humanity combined. So he put upon himself our humanity, brothers and sisters. Born of a woman by the name of Mary. And that is how he was begotten. Don't let nobody deceive you when they're thinking that he was begotten in some distant eternity, brothers and sisters. And the only other way he was begotten, according to Hebrews, he was begotten from the dead. And also the book of Acts. Very important. A lot of people out there who, cl who are coming, cl claiming to believe the message of truth for this time, our present truth, and they have various false teachings that they are promoting. And if you're not careful, you're not rooted and grounded in the scriptures, you'll be swept away. So we see that John one verses one through three and verse 14 is pointing us to Jesus Christ. This points to Jesus because Christ who is divine became a man, became flesh, took upon himself our sinful nature. It is possible for humanity because of what Jesus did it is possible for humanity through faith in Christ to tap into divine power, which will empower them, empower us to live a life of purity and holiness and victory over sin. And so when we receive Christ, we receive power. 
There it is, John 1, verse 12. But as many as did what? Received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when you receive Christ into your heart, you receive power. Now, the Bible told us that this table had a crown on it. Let's look at this. We're going to first go to, yeah, let's go, let's go to um, Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Let's see what that crown represents. Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. Psalm 24. Verse 7 through 10. The Bible says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Who is it? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Glory. So this is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the king of glory. Psalm 47 verse 2, for the Lord most high is terrible. He is a what? Great king over all the earth. So we see right here this table of showbread, who these priests, when they bring the table, when they bring the bread and when they had to pick up the bread, when they bring the new bread and take up the old bread, they have to kind of kneel down because the table is so short. It's pointing to how we are to bow before Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what it's pointing to, brothers and sisters. It is pointing to the fact that every single day we need fresh bread from Jesus. Every single day, brothers and sisters, we need a fresh experience with Jesus. And that happens when we take time to worship him, when we take time to spend with him. Psalm 48 verse 2, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the what? North. Remember that table of showbread is on the what? North side the size of the north, the city of the what? Great king. So we see right here, brothers and sisters, this is where the king is located. Jesus Christ on the size of the north. And that's why Satan said in Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible says, how art thou fall up from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Verse 12, how art thou cut down to the ground which did as weaken the nations? And then it goes on in the next verse, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend. I, he said, he said, for thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount on the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. What, what was Lucifer saying? I will sit as the new king by dethroning Jesus. But he don't have that power because Jesus is more powerful. And that's why the Bible said in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan found his place no more in heaven because he was cast out. Jesus won in heaven, he won at the cross, and he's going to win again before this thing is over. So we need to make sure that we're on the winning side. We're on the side of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And like I said, making sure that we're spending that time with him, that we're getting that daily bread so that we can be prepared when he comes, brothers and sisters. It is also important to note that not only was there a crown of gold for the table itself, but for the border enclosing the table also. A crown within a crown. Interesting. What does this symbolize? Is Christ just the average king? What kind of king is he? We're going to 1 Timothy chapter 6, looking at verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 13. 1 Timothy 6. Starting at verse 13, it says, I give charge, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until what? The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in times past, he shall show, who shall show? Jesus Christ, he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, king of what? 
kings and Lord of lords who only have immortality dwelling in a light which no man can approach unto whom no man have seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The fact that he has immortality lets you know, brothers and sisters, that he's God. And notice right here, it says he's the, tr he's the true potentate ruler and that he's king of what? Kings and Lord of Lords. It's not your average king. King of Kings. And that's why, uh, in Revelation, let me share this right here. And this is talking about Jesus also, because remember that the table it had like a crown within a crown, right? Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to look here at verse number. Let me see here. Revelation 19. Where should I start? I guess verse 11. Revelation 19, looking at verse 11. It says, and I saw heaven open. Yeah, verse 11. And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that knew that no man knew but that but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the what? Word of God. Who is the word in John chapter 1? Jesus. John, who wrote the gospel of John, is the same one who wrote under inspiration the book of Revelation. Same person. So we see right here that the word is Jesus Christ. And then verse 16, skipping on down, it says, And he hath on this vesture and on this thigh a name written, King of what? Kings and Lord of Lord, so we see he has many crowns, or we would say a crown within a crown. This is pointing to Jesus. Now, let's look at this border a little deeper. That word border in the original Hebrew means a stronghold. The border was the stronghold. It was the frame for the table and the crown on the table. A stronghold is a fortified place or a fortress. That's what it, this is. This is the definition of stronghold, a fortified place or a fortress, a place of survival or refuge. Who is our fortress and our refuge? Go to Psalm 91, Psalm 91. Notice what the Bible says here in Psalm 91. It says, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my what? Refuge and my what? Fortress. Who is our refuge and our fortress? The Lord. My what? God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and for the noisome pestilence. So, God, Jesus Christ, he is our refuge. He is our fortress. We're going to Proverbs now. Chapter 18, looking at verse 10. The Bible says, the name of the Lord is a what? Strong tower. The righteous run into it and is what? Safe. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Nahum 1 verse 7, the Lord is good, a what? Stronghold. Who is our stronghold? Jesus, the Lord, in the, in the day of trouble. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. When you're in trouble, run to the stronghold. When you're in trouble, brothers and sisters, bow before the stronghold. Get the strength that you need. Get the daily bread that you need so that you can stand in a crisis. Go to the stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that what? Trust in him. Are you in trouble? Go to the stronghold. 
go to the fortress, get to the refuge. If you don't, the storms of life will take you out. Very serious. We must abide in Jesus, the stronghold. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit for what? Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. You got to abide in the stronghold. What does it mean to abide in Christ, the stronghold? And how do we abide in him? First John 3, verse 6, whosoever abideth or dwell, just like Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, whosoever abideth or dwell in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. The power to overcome comes as a result of receiving Christ and knowing him. Having that relationship with him. Colossians 2 verse 6. It says right here, as ye therefore, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk ye in him. Him. As he received him by surrendering to him, saying, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, that should be your experience every single day. Not just one time. Now, it's not a one time thing. This is this is a daily experience. Sanctification, brothers and sisters, is the work of a lifetime. This is a day by day by day by day experience. You're abiding in Christ. You're submitting to him. You're saying, Lord, I surrender to your will every single day. You're taking heed to his commandments by faith in Christ and his power to keep you. It's a day by day experience. Justification, yeah, that's, that's, you do that one time, you make that surrender to Jesus, but that sanctification, that's a day-by-day -day experience, day-by-day. -day. So you abide in Christ the same way you received him into your life. Day-by-day, -day, you surrender to him. You surrender your will to him. Day-by-day, -day, you allow him to empower you to overcome sin and have total victory over sin. Christ is our only stronghold against the power of sin. We are safe in Jesus. When we do our part, brothers and sisters, God will do his part. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, looking at verse 9. The Bible says, for we are laborers together with who? God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We are to be co-laborers with God, brothers and sisters. We, we can't just let God do all the work. No. We have a part to play, and when we do our part, God does his part. Just like a justification, we have a part. Oh, yes, we do. You thought we didn't have a part? What's your part? Surrender. It's that simple. You surrendering your will to him. You are saying, yes, Lord, I give my heart to you. Yes, Lord, my will, I yield anew. You are surrendering at that experience of justification. That's your role. You surrender, God forgives, cleanses you from all sin and unrighteousness. In the walk of sanctification, you yield in obedience to Christ and his word, surrender to him by being obedient to him. And guess what? As you do that, he will work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You, you, may, you may have an inclination and desire to, to do something that you shouldn't do, but you choose to follow God. And as you do that, he begins to work in you something that is impossible for you to do in your own power, which is transforming your character. Don't let people th make you think that Sanctification is not important. Sanctification is very important. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, and we want to look at here, starting at verse number 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, where does the Bible say? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we're to do our part. Verse 3, Verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We do our part. God does his part. We work out. God works in. Don't ever forget that. 
Prophets and Kings, page 486, paragraph 3. Here, herein, see, we, 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 this, is why we talk, this is why we laid this foundation about the table of showbread. Wood pointing to humanity, gold pointing to divinity. We looked at the crown within the crown, we saw it point to Jesus Christ. So it's pointing to Christ who is our example, right? And so we see right here, Christ, by living a sinless life, he gave us an example showing that if, just like he was connected to the Father, if we are connected to him every single day, humanity, we're human, connected to divine power, connected to Christ, we can live a life of victory as well, like Jesus did. It says, herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation, without which no true success can be attained. Human efforts avail nothing without divine power. So if you're just thinking you got to do all the work, no, that's, that's, that's wrong. And neither should we have the idea that God has to do all the work. That's wrong also. No, it's the principle of cooperation. We read it in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Human effort avails nothing without divine power. And without divine endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our what? Part. His grace is given to work in us to will and to do, but never to substitute for our effort. Our part. What's our part? Let's look at our part. Let's break it down. Exodus 25 verse 30. Exodus 25 verse 30. We're going to look at this showbread, right? And we're going to show from this our part and also God's part. Exodus 25, looking at verse 30. The Bible says, and thou shalt set upon the table. What are we going to set on there? Showbread before me always. Set on the table, showbread, God says, before me always. That word always means continual or continuity. Constant, perpetual. What does this point to? Matthew 4, verse 4. Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, and the devil said, if you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Jesus responded to him by saying, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So that's what that bread points to, the word of God. We are to have this word of God set before us continually. Job 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed thy words. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Luke 11, verse 3. Give us this day our what? Daily bread, continual bread, constant, perpetual. It's not a one-time thing. We got to partake of this bread every single day. The word of God must be studied continually every single day. If you're not eating this word, you will not survive spiritually. Many professed Christians are malnourished and are on the verge of death. Why? No prayer, no study. Not taking the time to feast on God's word. What is the purpose of the word? And what are we to do with the word? First Timothy 3, looking at verse 16 to 17, the Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The word of God is designed to bring us to perfection. It's designed to instruct us in doctrine, to give us reproof, to give us correction if we're going in the wrong direction. Instruct us in righteousness that we may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. Oh, oh works is not important. Oh, yes, it is. James says, faith without works is dead. You can say, I believe, the devil believes and tremble but he doesn't have works accompanying his so-called faith or belief. 
Faith and works go hand in hand. Your works reveal your faith. Your faith is demonstrated by your works. Not that you're trying to work to be saved, no. But because you're showing your faith, because you have faith in God, faith in Jesus, you have a faith that works by love. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You, because you believe in Christ, and you have love for him, you exercise that faith by your lifestyle, your works. So the Bible says the word of God is designed to teach us that. Proverbs 30, verse five, every word of God is what? Pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And then Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Let's see what the Bible says here in John chapter 15. We're studying, brothers and sisters. This is called studying God's word. We're looking at John 15, verses 1 through 3. Jesus says, I am the true vine. There are a lot of false vines out there, but Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3, he says, now you are what? Clean or pured, purified. You are clean or purified through the what? Word which I have spoken unto you. Now the Bible lets us know that we are clean, we are made pure through the what? Word. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Let's see what the Bible says here in Psalm 119. I hope you're writing these scriptures down. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. These are not my words, this is God's word. What does the Bible say in Psalm? We looked at the New Testament. Now we're looking at the Old Testament. The Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word purifies us. 1 Peter 1, 22 says, seeing, you, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Now remember Psalm 119 verse 9 says, you, it says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word. Taking heed means be obedient. That's what the Bible says. And so in, going back to the New Testament, it says, seeing ye have purified your souls in doing what? Obeying the truth. But we can't do it in our own power. That's why we got to be surrendered to Christ every single day. So when we do our part, we choose to be obedient. The Holy Spirit comes and works in us to will and to do, to give us the power to do of his good pleasure. So seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth, how? Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Let's move on now. So when I partake of God's word, who am I partaking of? We're going to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 51 to 57. John 6, 51 through 57. Notice what the Bible says here. It says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him as the living father hath sent me and I live by the father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So this bread also points to Jesus. The table pointed to Jesus. Table for the, ta for the, ta uh, the showbread. The table of showbread pointed to Jesus. The showbread itself 
points to Jesus and his word. He is the word. Isn't that something? Then the Bible says in verse 63, because he demonstrated by his life the word of God. He was obedient to his father's commandments. He was a living example of the spoken word, brothers and sisters. He was a perfect reflection of the father. Verse 63, it is a spirit that quicken if the flesh profit of nothing. The words that I speak unto you, whereas you say they are spirit and they are life. How is Jesus revealed? From his word. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's why Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, but in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. The scripture points us to Jesus. Matthew 26, verse 26 to 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, that bread points us to Jesus and his word. So when you partake of the word, you're partaking of Jesus. When you study God's word, you are partaking of Christ because the scriptures reveal Jesus. The question is, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the NBA? Are you hungry for football season that's coming up? Are you hungry for the alcohol? Are you hungry for cigarettes, drugs, caffeine? Are you hungry for a woman, another man? Are you hungry for the, 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 the new car, the new clothes? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for these things that you see on the screen? Is this what you're feeding your children? If this is what you are feeding your children, brothers and sisters, if this is what you call satisfying their hunger, this is going to wipe them out in the end, I'm telling you. All these things are indoctrinating your children, preparing them, preparing them to be lost. And these things that you set before your own eyes will prepare you to be lost if you don't change your priorities. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. Great Controversy 519, paragraph 2. What has your attention, brothers and sisters? This is, this is no time to be distracted. This is a time to get everything we can from the word of God. What were the instructions concerning the table of showbread? We're going to go to Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. Leviticus 24, 5 through 9, as we look at the instructions concerning the, table, concerning the showbread. It says, Thou shalt take, verse 5, and thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake, and thou shalt set them in two rows. Six on a row and upon the pure table, upon the pure table before the Lord. So you got a, a set of 12. You got uh, 12 cakes in all. One row of six and another row of six. It says right here in verse 7, And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the, on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So frankincense also was added to this bread. And we're going to read all the way to verse 9, actually. Let's, let's, let's continue to read. Verse 8. Every Sabbath, he, the priest, shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken 
from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto them of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. It's interesting, fresh, sab fresh bread had to be laid every Sabbath. When you go to church, brothers and sisters, you should be getting fresh bread from the pulpit. Too often our ministers are serving staled bread, moldy bread. A lot of times it's not even wholesome bread. A lot of times it's wonder bread. That wonder bread will cause you to wonder after the things in the world and ultimately wonder after the beast. Here it is. Every Sabbath, a new set of bread was placed on the table while the old set was eaten by the priest. Every Sabbath, we, are to, we as a royal priesthood are to have a fresher and deeper experience. Each Sabbath, we're to have this, this deep experience in divine things. This true bread will help us to be fitted to meet the temptations of the weak. Not wonder bread. Wonder bread or watered down sermons will prepare you to wonder after the beast. Preacher ain't preaching nothing but uh, the, talking about Dorothy and, and, and the Wizard of Oz and, that, and, and try to use that as a sermon illustration. He's preaching Wonder Bread messages. That preacher standing up on the pulpit and he's, he, he, he's saying that we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. We, we cannot have victory. He's preaching to you Wonder Bread sermons. That preacher that get up and, 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 and talking about, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we like Harry Potter and all this and that. We're trying to make use those worldly things that's loaded with spiritualism to make an illustration and, 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 and try to use that as the theme of his message. Talking about, you know, we got to be like Kobe Bryant and, and all this other foolishness. He's preaching wonder bread messages. And it's those wonder bread messages that will cause you, brothers and sisters, if you keep sitting under this foolishness, to be lost. I got to be quite frank with you. We don't have time for Wonder Bread sermons, sermons, Wonder Bread messages. We need whole wheat messages, whole grain, nine grain seeded messages, stuff with something with substance to it. You know, Wonder Bread, see Wonder Bread, you can ball, you can ball that thing up into a whole ball. Why? It's like dough. It's moldable. Why? Because it has no substance to it. All the minerals are taken out. Five of the, the different things that, that make it wholesome is taken out. Oh, but, but it's enriched. Enriched with things not good for your health. Spiritually, with these Wonder Bread sermons, enriched with error. Enriched with heresy. Enriched with falsehood. Enriched with the wine of Babylon. Why sin under that foolishness? I don't, I really don't understand it. I really don't understand how God's people will sit under wonder bread, watered down sermons, Sabbath after Sabbath. I really don't understand that. When you are to get fresh bread, based on the sanctuary message, this is from the sanctuary message. The priests, we are the royal priesthood, brothers and sisters. We are to get fresh bread, fresh meals, fresh sermons, wholesome sermons if you were the church that's getting wholesome sermons you you better not take it for granted i'm telling you there are a lot of people sitting at home wish they can get it we must have faith in what god's word has the power to do romans 1 verse 17 for therein is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by what faith And looking at this sanctification thing again, I want you to understand that when we're going from the experience of justification to sanctification, understand it's not justification by faith, then just sanctification. No, it's sanctification by faith. Justification, sanctification all together makes up the, the teaching of righteousness by faith. It says right here in Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by what? Faith that is in me. We have faith that Christ will justify us. 
we must have faith that he will work in us to sanctify us. That you're, you, that you just outwardly being obedient to his word will not suffice. He must work in us and he must empower us to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, we looked at our part. Now let's look at God's part. All right. What's his part? So besides the table over being overlaid with gold, symbolizing Christ's divinity and humanity, overlaid with gold, the wood pointing to humanity, gold pointing to divinity. What does the table symbolize also? Psalm 23, verse 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. See, God provides provisions for us. He sets a table before us. What are these provisions? Exodus 25, verse 29 and 30. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and the covers, jars thereof, and the bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them, and thou shalt set upon the table what? Show bread before me. He lays before us his word. And of course, you in, in order to eat, you need utensils, right? God has given us something to help us to understand his word. He has given us the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. He will guide us into all truth, according to John chapter 16, brothers and sisters. The bread symbolized God's word that will do what it says it will do. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Psalm 29, verse 11, the Lord will give strength. He will give what? Strength. That word strength means power unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Ephesians 3, verse 16 says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be what? Strengthened. That word strengthened means empowered with might by his spirit in the inner man. He's provided us, brothers and sisters, his word. That's what he provided for the, when he laid this table. He provided his word and he's given us the utensils to help us in partaking of his word. And that main instrument is the Holy Spirit. There are 12 cakes on the table. Six. Each row is a row of six. It's six, uh, six on each row, rather. What do these 12 cakes point to? Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. Revelation chapter 7, looking at verse 4. The Bible says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Interesting. So we see that this also points to the 144,000. And of course, it points to the literal tribes of Israel, no doubt, but it also points to spiritual Israel. I'm looking at this in light of the times in which we live. The 144,000. What makes them so special? Revelation 7, verse 13 and 14. In order to be a part of the 144,000 brothers and sisters, we must allow God to work in and we must work out. We must be surrendered to Christ. We must be obedient to his word and his statutes. We, we, must, we, we must partake of this, this bread, this word every single day with the help of his Holy Spirit. Just like you got the utensils out there with the bread, it's like you need utensils to eat. We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand his word, brothers and sisters. And so Revelation 17, looking at verse 13 and 14, the Bible says this. Revelation 7, 13 and 14, what makes 144,000 so special? And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of what? 
great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the what? Blood of the Lamb. They came out of great tribulation. Revelation 14, verse 1, they came out of a time of trouble, such as devil was since there was a nation. Revelation 14, verse 1, and we're also going to look at verse 4 and 5. The Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And when you look up that word name in the original Greek, because the New Testament is Greek, Look it up in the original Greek. That word name means authority and also character, character, anoma. That's the Greek word, anoma, the Greek word for name, anoma, meaning authority or character. So the 144,000, they were there with the lamb, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And the Bible says that they had the father's name, the father's character written in their forehead. What makes them special? They reflect the image of Jesus fully. Have we gotten to that point? Looking at verse 4 and 5. Have we gotten to that point, brothers and sisters? Do you want to be a part of this number? Got to have this experience that we talked about looking at this table of showbread. It says, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. They refuse to be defiled by false teachings. They refuse to be defiled by Wonder Bread sermons. They refuse to be defiled by churches. Woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. By churches that are giving Wonder Bread messages, feeding the people the wine of Babylon. They refuse to be defiled by, by ministers who are nothing but Babylonian bartenders feeding the people Babylonian wine. They refuse to be defiled by it. They, these are they which follow the Lamb, whether so wherever you go. They follow Jesus step by step. They follow in his steps. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and onward, it says, For even here too will you call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. That has to be our experience, following the Lamb. Just like Jesus reflected the character of his father, we had to reflect the character of the father also through the power of the indwelling Christ. Christ in you, the Bible says, the hope of glory. Can't do it in our own strength. We need divine power in order for this to happen. Verse 5, and in their mouth was found what? No guile, no deceit. That's what the word guile means. For they are without fault, without sin before the throne of God but I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it. What does the Bible say in Jude 1, verse 24 and 25? It says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Who was able to do it? Jesus. Do you have faith to believe that he's able to keep you from falling? Or are you dependent upon your own strength and own might? And if you're doing that, you're constantly going to fall. But if you're depending upon a power outside of yourself to, to do that, he will keep you from falling. That's why it's sanctification by faith. It's not just justification by faith, it's sanctification by faith. Because in sanctification by faith, we have to be dependent upon God, dependent upon Jesus to keep us from falling. Because justification, we choose to abide in Christ. And of course, we've got to make that surrender to Christ every single day. But in sanctification, we must allow Christ to live in us. What makes the 144,000 so special? These have gone through great tribulation. These follow the lamb, Jesus, whithersoever you go with. These are without fault, meaning they're without moral spot. They're without sin. Without sin, yes. You and I must get to the point where we are without sin. They have the seal of God and the character of God in their foreheads. That must be our experience. See, Daniel had the characteristics of the 144,000, friends. And let me tell you this, very important. What we eat, this is in Daniel 1. Daniel and his companions, they decided, no, we're not going to defile ourselves with the king's meat. We're not going to defile ourselves with the, with the lobster and the crab legs 
and, and ham hocks and, and all these different things that's on the table and, and the liquor that's on the table and the, and the fermented wine. We're not going to defile ourselves with that. Give us pulse. Give us vegetables. Give us grains. Give us nuts. Give us water. That will suffice. Prove us 10 days. After 10 days, they were proven to be 10 times wiser than all the other wise men. But they, were, they, they, they took a risk in doing it. They took a risk. That, see, that was during a time of a health crisis. Ooh. See, right here in Daniel chapter 1, that was, they, they, meet, they met a crisis right then and there that tested them on the health side of things. That crisis tested them on the health side of things. They were tested. Are you going to eat the king's meat? Are you, are, are you going to decline it? Hmm. It was mandatory. It wasn't, it wasn't optional. This is what, boom, you eat this. But they had the boldness to say, no, give us pulse. Mills all say, man, you get my hair cut off. He said, prove us 10 days. Prove us 10 days. And God proved himself faithful. They passed the health test. That prepared them for the religious test. For the three Hebrew men in Daniel chapter 3, the fiery furnace, the image being set up, they, those who did not bow down to the image would be cast into the fiery furnace. How, how, did, how were they able to stand in? They stood then because they stood during the health test. When they stood, when they decided to take a stand on health, they were able to make a stand when it came to religious matters. Daniel, when he decided to take a stand on health, he was able to make a stand during religious matters, during the religious crisis. Can't pray to nobody but the king for, for, for a certain amount of days. How did he pass? Because he passed the health crisis. And I see right now many of God's professed people right now, we're in the midst of a health crisis, a health crisis that many of us have never witnessed before, the implications and the different laws that are put in place that we have never seen before in our lifetime. I've talked to individuals who are older in years. They say, I've never seen anything like this in all my life. And we're living in it right here. And we see God's professed people who had the truth of the three angels' messages, who had the truth of the health message, who had the truth of natural remedies, who had the truth about using water treatments and all these various things. They are bending to, just, to the world. They are bending to the principles of the government just like everybody else. And we think we're going to pass the religious crisis when it comes. No, we are failing the health crisis. And if we don't repent, and shoulder ourselves together, we will fail the religious crisis. Why? Because we are demonstrating a lack of faith in God. Promoting an inoculation that is experimental that those who get it still get sick. Instead of promoting the eight laws of health, what is wrong with us? And we think we're going to be a part of this number while we're acting like the world and partaking of his spirit. No, you're not. No, you're not. A church and a pastor decide to host a, a, a particular program with, with different doctors. With one of those doctors was Dr. Perinich, who was at our camp meeting and some other doctors, and this, I mean, it's just a fair discussion. And the, they had one before with, the, with this one particular pastor. I'm not even going to say his name, I'm just, just, just to protect him. But this, this pastor who hosted it, along with this church, a part of such and such conference, I mean, you had a, 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 a conference president who was moderating the, the, the particular thing, and praise God for that, for, for, for him willing to open the floor for that discussion. But then, but you know, that, that pastor who hosted it, he, he was not, that, that conference president was not his employee, was not his employer. He was a part of another conference. And so they, you know, that, that particular uh, discussion, that Zoom meeting, talking about the inoculation and different things, showing the pros, the one side, you had one doctor giving his 
reasons why it's, there's pros, and then you had the other doctor giving a reason why there were cons to it, why, why you know, it, it wasn't effective. And so both had an opportunity to present. It was just, it, you, know, wait, you know, giving the people opportunity to weigh both sides. And so there was another meeting that, that, that was going to happen, hosted by the same pastor. And this pastor is told to cancel this meeting because it does not meet the guidelines of, uh, 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 of the church and, and that, that, that this right here is uh, going against what we believe as a church, because as a church, we believe in the inoculation. We believe in this. And if you are allowing these individuals to come on this platform to present this and represent this church and this conference as a pastor, you, you, that, that you can't do that. So he says, I've been told to cancel the meeting. So they had to cancel it. But thankfully, with, you know, with him and his church out of the picture, the other the, the doctors decide to move forward and they're going to go ahead and, and, and do this on their own now. But it's just a shame, a shame that the, 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 the regular lines, the conference, had the audacity to jump on this minister because he decided, now whether he's for or against, that's not the issue. The fact of the matter is he gave a, a fair, he opened the door for a fair discussion. So people can make a decision. Okay, let's hear both sides. Let's hear both sides and make our own decisions what we must do. That was fair. And they said, no, you can't do that. What kind of sense is that? Just hear one side and you can't hear the other. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. If a church that claims to believe in the, in the spirit of prophecy, claims to believe in keeping the commandments of God, claiming to believe in, 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 in the health message and all those various things. And they're going contrary to this thing in a health crisis. When the religious crisis come, they will fail. Mark my words. You can get upset with me. You can inbox me. You can say, oh, you can't say that. Oh, you're bashing. Oh, you can make your own decision on that. Because I see brethren right now, they are showing their character because they are failing to speak out. They won't open their mouth. They're too afraid. And God will hold you accountable for not opening your mouth, for not speaking out on these things that are happening. You will be held accountable. I don't care if you're in the conference. I don't care if you have a self-supporting church. You see what's going on, but you're on mute. God can't use you. He cannot use you. Why? Because you are fearful. What does the Bible say about the fearful? Well, I'm scared what people think. I'm scared they're going to call me an offshoot. I'm scared I might get fired. You know what the Bible says about the fearful? The fearful and the unbelieving are outside of the holy city. We better wake up and stop playing these games. I don't care what people say about me. I'm at this point, brothers and sisters, we're in a serious crisis. Individuals are revealing their characters. Churches, I don't care, you're regular, irregular. I don't care what it is. It don't even matter at this point. We need to be following Christ. We need to be teaching this truth. And if we are afraid to stand for the truth and, and, and reflect Christ's character to the world and these principles to the world, man, God can't use us. Who are we fooling? Call yourself who you want to call yourself. Call yourself remnant, present truth. You, 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 you none of those things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Because this, brothers and sisters, if we don't change our ways, and if we don't get back to the blueprint, and some of us who are afraid to speak out, we're on mute, we're silent, because we're afraid what people will think, and we try to, we, we, we're, we're trying to tone down our messages, and we ain't preaching, we're just preaching nothing. Man, God, I'm sorry, man, come on. What are you doing? What are you doing? God will take the vineyard from you and give it to another. How do we follow the lamb? How do the 144,000 follow the lamb? Let's read this. I didn't want to get too far off onto that, but brothers and sisters, I'm just seeing things right here transpire before my very eyes and seeing that we're living in the end time 
And I, I just see, I, I just see the behavior of God's professed people cl- calling themselves the remnant, calling themselves the remnant. And all this, this, this going back and forth, we must be regular. No, no, you, you, you gotta be, you gotta be in the regular line. If you're not in the regular lines, you, 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 God can't use you. You, you, you God can't use that. Or, 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 come out of the regular line and come into the irregular. All those other food, man, this stuff don't even matter anymore. It don't even matter anymore because the bottom line is, is your name written in the book of life? Are you doing what God has called you to do? Are you standing for the principles of truth? I don't care what line you're in. If you're not in Christ, you out of line. Whether you regular or irregular line, if you're not in Jesus, you out of line. We need to stop this foolishness. We want to try to quote a spirit of prophecy quotations. To try, yeah, see, see, look, 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 look. You got to come on. The, man, stop this foolishness, man. God is not in this. God is looking for a people who's going to stand for the truth, bottom line. That's it. And follow him. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what group you're in. Regular, irregular. If you for real, we're going to be standing shoulder to shoulder. And God's going to have an army to finish this work. 1 Peter 2, verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, Verse 21, First Peter 2, verse 21. For even here unto where you call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example, leaving us an example, that ye shall follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Verse 23. Who when, he was, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. This is the word of God, brothers and sisters. We got to reflect Christ. That's the bottom line. We got to stand for truth like Jesus did. Even if it cost us. Just as Jesus did no sin, they too, the 144,000, would do no sin. What does this mean? Revelation 15, verse 2. Let's go there. We're, we're, We're closing this message out. Revelation 15. Looking at verse two, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then I had gotten a victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. We got out a victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark. We're bowing down to the principles of the world during the health crisis. We will bow down to the beast, his image, and his mark. If we're standing on God's health principles, if we're standing right now, overcoming every temptation, overcoming appetite, overcoming pride, the love of the world, the fashions of the world, overcoming these things, if we stand, brothers and sisters, we will stand when the crisis, the religious crisis comes. We have victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. And that comes as a result of day by day having the experience with Jesus. I could show you articles showing how close we are to the mark of the beast crisis, but brothers and sisters, you've seen article after article after article. There are some that they just, that's all they talk about, just, they just show you article, 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 article. They don't mean nothing, brothers and sisters. When we, but, uh, but when we get to the practicality of things, that's where the rubber meets the road. How we're standing, how are you standing right now during the crisis? Whether it's a health crisis, whether it's a personal crisis, how are you standing? Because it's in a crisis that character is revealed. How are you standing? That's what it all boils down to. How are you standing during a religious crisis? Are you ready? That's the question. That's the question, brothers and sisters. Jesus is inviting you to come. In Isaiah 55, because in of ourselves, we don't have the power. But there's one who does have the power. And he gives us the invitation here. In Isaiah 51, looking at verses 1 to 3, Hold every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that have no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? 
and your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. That's what God is calling us to do, brothers and sisters. Come, come. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Do you want rest? Do you want peace? Do you want to be ready for the crisis that's fast approaching? Don't you hear the thunder rumbling? Don't you hear the soldiers? Don't you hear the, the horses? If we can't run with the footmen, what are we going to do when the horses go? If in a time of peace they wearied you, what are you going to do with the swelling of the Jordan? We're getting weary. And, and the real Christ ain't even came yet. We're bickering and fighting over who, who's this and who's that. And when we look at our lives, we're not ready for this crisis. Let's be real. Are you ready? The only way you can be ready, the only way I can be ready, is partaking daily of the bread. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. And Lord, I get passionate about what's going on among us as a people. And these things disturb me. Lord, because you've given us so much light and so much truth. And we're failing to do what we need to do during this health crisis. We're failing, what we, we're failing to do what we need to do. We're not living up to the standard. We're showing we're not ready for a religious crisis. Lord, I'm praying that you'll hold back the wind so that your people can get in a position to do what we need to do. Because right now, if everything was to break loose, a lot of people, regular and irregular, will give up. But I pray those of us who are listening, myself, we will not be a part of that number. We will be a part of the number who reflect the image of Jesus fully, part of that number who will give their last warning message. So, Lord, it all starts with us partaking daily of the bread, partaking of the word which points to Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us. May that be our experience. May we not be so rushed like Martha, but may we... May we have the devotional spirit like Mary so that we can gain the strength that we need for the, for the dangerous future. Bless us all. Keep us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any topic or question, please comment below. Thank you for your prayers and continued support.